All right, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Bill Levine from uh, New York and uh, welcome to the introductory fellows core curriculum uh, sponsored by the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons. I'd like to especially thank uh, Ranjan Gupta and Gus Mazaka, the co-chairs of the ASCS Education Committee and uh, Joaquin Sanchez Sotelo, uh, who's gonna lead us off tonight uh, for this eight week series. This is following up a really successful 16 week uh, COVID uh, core curriculum that uh, Ranjan and um, Gus put together in rapid fire to help uh, all the fellows across the country. So we're really proud of all the work they've done. And we thought it would be great to continue the, the positive momentum uh, that was created by that program to get the new fellows uh, up to speed. I see that we also have some AOSSM fellows uh, on the uh, uh, program tonight, so that's great. And we will certainly extend that um, the invitation to more AOSSM fellows if they would like to participate uh, for the next seven weeks. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Joaquin. Thank you, Bill. Uh, welcome, everyone. As Dr. Levine just mentioned, this is an eight-week review of the uh, fundamentals of shoulder and elbow surgery, and we really hope everyone listening will learn and enjoy. The topic tonight is physical examination of the shoulder. And uh, Dr. Peter Millet needs no introduction. He's an outstanding clinician, surgeon, and researcher, and I'm sure that he will share incredible pearls that you will find it useful in your fellowship and practice. Dr. Vani Savesan, another incredible clinician and surgeon, will be offering her pearls, as well as maybe question Dr. Millet on some of his teaching. We love interaction, so please, please use the chat window to ask any questions you may have. We will be monitoring that. This program is for you, so we really hope that this will be a great kickoff of your fellowship year. So now I would ask Dr. Millet and Dr. Savesan to please start the program. Peter? Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's nice to see you all in two dimensions. I look forward to the time when we can all be together in person. Uh, it's a, this is a great topic to talk about because it's really uh, found, uh, fundamental to uh, being a good shoulder surgeon is to being able to do a good examination of the shoulder. And I'm really proud, proud to uh, be here tonight with Vani Sabison, who's going to also uh, share some cases and add some commentary in and correct me where I where I mess up. So I look forward to a good, healthy, nice uh, discussion and debate. So I'm just gonna see if I can advance my slide here. <laughs> so also a special thanks to the ASES and to our president, uh, Will Lev uh, Bill Levine for uh, his uh, leadership and for um, putting together this program for our, for our fellows and all the, the team at the ASES that uh, allowed this to happen. It's important to remember that um, the history and physical examination are really foundational to the correct diagnosis. And I show this old medical bag here to, to remind us that we didn't always have MRIs and x-rays and CT scans. Uh, a lot was learned before we had those. And it's really always important to remember that the physical examination and history are so uh, paramount to achieving the correct diagnosis. And without the correct diagnosis, uh, the surgery really doesn't matter because you can't do the correct surgery unless you have the correct diagnosis. So hopefully uh, we'll share with, with you tonight some pearls so that you can get the correct diagnosis and then you can get to the fun part, which is the surgery. A lot of what I'm going to present tonight is, is um, uh, collated in this book we wrote about physical examination of the shoulder, um, which I would encourage any of the fellows who have interest in this to take a look at. Uh, these are some of my fellows who I've trained over the years and we've had, uh, we've learned an awful lot from them, uh, but we've also shared a lot uh, and um, I hope that you all take advantage of your mentors during your fellowship. It's a wonderful year. So the caref a careful history oftentimes will lead to the, to the diagnosis. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the history, but some important things to think about are, are the onset uh, the duration of the symptoms, what's the progression been? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Is it stable? Uh, is it a problem of pain? Is it a problem of function? Is it a problem of weakness? Is it a problem of instability or is it a problem of stiffness? And those are some of the common uh, things that patients will come in and complain about. And it's really important to, to think about all those different aspects to the history. The physical examination can be broken down into a a series of different categories. We start off with inspection, uh, 
a lot can be learned just from looking at the patient. Like you see here, patients with obvious deformities of their shoulder, and you can oftentimes make the diagnosis just by observing them. It's really important uh, to remove the patient's shirt or blouse uh, so that you can see both shoulders and really examine them carefully from the front and the back. After inspection, we have palpation, uh, trying to palpate where there's areas of tenderness. We look at range of motion, both actively and passively. Uh, we test strength, and then we do special tests to look for specific problems, whether it be instability, cuff, uh, or other types of special tests, which we'll go through. It's also important to always examine the joint above and below the injured joint. Uh, these are some principles of orthopedics in, in the shoulder, it's the neck. Uh, neck pain can be referred to the shoulder. We look at range of motion. We look for a spurling sign or a lermitz. And we also check the elbow. Usually pain from the shoulder will radiate distal. Usually does not go distal to the elbow. Uh, and neck pain usually has, uh, can go all the way to the hand. So you can tell a little bit about this when you examine the patient carefully. You need to so sort out the primary cause of the pain and really physical examination plus or minus selective uh, injections is really the, the key to this in addition to your imaging studies. The innervation of the shoulder is complex. Uh, mostly it's from the uh, C5 through eight uh, nerve roots. Uh, and it's important to know all these different nerves uh, and what muscles they innervate uh, because uh, you can determine uh, how they can either get compressed individually or they can get compressed at the cervical, uh, cervical area and then radiate distally. So uh, Bonnie, I'd like to turn it over to you. This is a case that you uh, submitted uh, and it's an orthopedic surgeon who, who illustrates some of these points. So, I mean, I think that, you know, it's important to also just, I wanna make a point, you know, in COVID and in the current pandemic, you know, a lot of this stuff is going virtual. And, you know, for our fellows, when you get out into practice, I mean, I think the hardest part is now when you're, you know, on a, FaceTime, Google, trying to diagnose these things that if you're in question, the importance of just bringing a patient in, trying to emphasize that. I really think it's really important just that we, we mention that because I think the future that telehealth is really gonna become part of our practices and really just discerning who you need to bring in and who you don't is important. So but maybe this is a a Yeah, 54 year old male surgeon with periscapular pain. And you know, this pain was described as severe stabbing pain with some, some shoulder exams that showed some significant limitations. And so, I mean, you know, you, you're thinking right away sort of a, as a surgeon, this person's probably gonna have pretty good function. And then you see on exam, they really have some limitations. C-spine sort of showed some sensory loss, which was unusual. And most of the time we don't really do as good of a sensory um, exam. And it's important to do that, especially in a case like this where their function is so limited. And so really sort of what are you thinking in this case? You know, you have some notable sensory loss, some, you know, limitations in range of motion. And then really the C-spine, uh, so imaging is the first question. So do you get imaging of the shoulder? Do you get imaging of the neck? And, you know, and this surgeon obviously sort of had a little bit more subtlety came with imaging. And so the, the problem is he came with imaging that showed pathology of that neck and the shoulder. And I just think sometimes we forget that, you know, this um, crossover can be significant, you know, and ended up coming originally without the C-spine imaging. We worked it up further and ended up getting an ACDF ultimately. So I think that's really significant. And, you know, and I'm going to go through, keep going, Peter. There's, you know, the whole importance here, this is a different case, but the whole idea and the importance of really just making sure that you don't see a massive cuff tear, you don't see neurologic imaging where you see the subtlety of the loss and the, and the, and the subsequent supination here, that those neurologic deficits versus a massive cuff tear can be overlapping. And it's really important that, that you know, the exam is the critical finding here. There is nothing else that's gonna tell you those subtleties. Next slide. And just to remember that there is um, a significant um, crossover in, in a number of our patients. And there was a statistic and it's in the next slide that really talks about that you're gonna see, you know, you know, 30%, well, 15 to 20% of patients have an overlapping cervical spine pathology with their cuff tears. So just remember it, I think we do it a lot, but we don't always examine the neck. 
and just the importance of that. You know, there are some very significant exam findings in the neck. And one of them I just thought just to remind people is really that Sperling sign can be very specific, although not sensitive. And so it's just a reminder to do it. And remember, obviously, pain distal to the elbow is always a tip off for us. Great, thank you. So I think those key points are really important, that, that radiation of the pain. And then I would add that I always examine the neck and I stress that to my fellows, we always examine the neck in every patient who comes in with a shoulder complaint. And, uh, you know, as you said, um, this type of pseudoparalysis that was demonstrated in that uh, video uh, may exist con concomitantly with a rotator cuff tear. So don't, don't just focus on the shoulder exam. You could, you could miss a cervical spine issue. So continuing with inspection, a lot can be gleaned just from looking at the patient. Uh, you can look at the skin. You can see if they have any scars, if they have keloids. Do they have some type of a rash or erythema from a prior surgery that might indicate a chronic infection? Uh, sometimes when you look at their muscles, you can identify um, deformities. Here you see a, at the top, you see atrophy in the infraspinatus fossa. Uh, and the bottom, you see deformity of the pec. So a lot can be learned just from uh, inspecting the patient. This patient has a massive cuff tear and this patient has a, has a pec rupture. So you can just determine that just by looking at them. Uh, you can look for asymmetry with muscle wasting, as you see at the top here, again, a, a massive cuff tear. Uh, this can also be seen with suprascapular neuropathy. You can see this patient here with a Popeye deformity. You can see winging. You can see clavicular deformities in clavicle fractures or uh, SC joint injuries or in AC joint injuries. And like, like I showed here, a Popeye deformity indicative of, of a biceps rupture. Uh, you can look for previous surgical scars. That may suggest a failed repair. Uh, do they have some type of a, a neuroma from prior clavicle surgery that's causing their pain? Do they have an infection like this patient here uh, with significant erythema? Are there uh, significant abrasions, bruises, ecchymosis? We see a lot of uh, bike injuries here. We always look for significant abrasions, which might uh, indicate underlying tr trauma or might preclude surgery while those abrasions uh, heal. And it's really important to always look uh, at the contralateral side. Uh, moving on here, this is a patient who comes in inspection, uh, you know, after a rotator cuff repair. You can see just from your inspection of her, she's able to have good function and, re and the motion here is quite good and she has good strength. So just on, on basic inspection, you can predict that this patient's likely doing well. Uh, this person here is an elderly gentleman. Obviously, as he tries to raise his arm on inspection, you can see that there's significant anterior superior escape of his prosthesis. Uh, you can al almost read the label of the implant through his skin. Uh, but you can see that he's having, going to have a lot of trouble and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't take a lot of uh, additional examination to determine what the problem is. This is an NFL wide receiver who comes in with significant deformity of his uh, left clavicle. You can see that it's, uh, it's dis uh, displaced posteriorly and it's locked. It's, it's uh, through the AC capsule and uh, posteriorly uh, dislocated. Another patient here, this is a, uh, um, an airman who was jumping out of a, a plane and he got uh, caught by the static line and has a, a mid-substance mid biceps rupture. Uh, kind of a rare, unique injury, but you do see this from time to time. And you can learn a lot just by, just by carefully looking at the patient. Another patient here that came in to see me with clicking of the shoulder. You can see that they have subluxation of the SC joint. You can visibly identify the medial clavicle uh, popping in and out um, as, they add, um, as they retract and protract their scapula. Uh, another patient here, these are some more subtle findings you might see if you look from the side. Sometimes you might notice some muscle wasting in the infraspinatus fossa. Uh, and it's really important to look at these details. Uh, this could either be neuropathic or more commonly it would be to a chronic uh, rotator cuff uh, type of tear. Um, the scapula exam is, is something else we always look at. There's six motions in three planes. Uh, 
Uh, you can have winging or you can have dyskinesia of the scapula. Uh, we tend to see a lot of dyskinesia in patients who have uh, other shoulder disorders or in some athletes. And Kibler has really described three types, inferior, medial, and superior dyskinesia. Uh, and it's always important to, to, to look at this uh, from posterior. It's easy to look at the patient from the front, but we always try and do a dynamic examination from the back as well. Here's a patient here. He's a uh, these are two professional baseball pitchers. Uh, the one on the bottom actually was uh, more talented than the one on the top, even though his physique is not quite as good. But you can see the positioning of the scapula on both sides on the left is, is quite uh, uh, more inferior. Or there's a tosis of the, of the right scapula on both of those uh, athletes. And with a rehab program, as you see on the right, uh, you can see how their scapular position has improved on both of those shoulders. So they've been able to improve their dyskinesia just with a rehab program. Uh, we also look for crepitation. There's different bursae that can get affected in the scapula. The scapula thoracic bursa is the most, most common. There's also a trapezoid bursa, which is more superior. Uh, and this can present as a snapping scapula syndrome or scapula thoracic bursitis, which oftentimes is misdiagnosed as chronic pain syndrome or myofascial syndrome. If you carefully examine the scapula, you can see that. This is another uh, case here. This is an, a, a patient, he's a gentleman who came into my office, uh, unable to raise his arms. He complained of shoulder weakness. And you can see here that he has bilateral symmetric winging. Um, this is a case of uh, fascioscapular humeral dystrophy. And this is how it may present to you as a patient who comes in with, with weakness of their shoulders is more common that they get this significant atrophy of all their rhomboids and you see the subsequent winging of their, of their scapula as a result of that. Uh, scapular winging, you can get a variety of different causes of winging. Uh, serratus anterior dysfunction is probably the most common we see uh, and that causes this, uh, the, the winging that you see in this patient here with difficulty with forward elevation. We can also have trapezius dysfunction. Uh, this is oftentimes caused in a post-surgical pa patient in my, case, in my experience after a lymph node dissection in the neck. Uh, or you can see these patients with FSH where it's more symmetrical and bilateral and there's significant wasting of the posterior uh, shoulder girdle muscles. And Peter, uh, here, I would say that this one specifically, when you look at that, it tends to be a lot of those wingings are missed by a lot of other clinicians and there's a lot of other workup that shows up before you even see that. So I would say that's probably one of the most common things early in my practice. I had a couple of women that had, you know, breast cancer with lymph, like lymphectomies that showed up and they'd had all kinds of workup for all kinds of things. So, I mean, for fellows, it's really something to remember on your radar because it's missed a lot from other clinicians. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and they can coexist like the neck and shoulder problems can coexist. It can coexist uh, with other shoulder problems, particularly in my experience, I see a lot of patients who have posterior shoulder instability that get a compensatory winging as they try and anavert their glenoid to keep it stable. And it's oftentimes diagnosed as winging when really it's a compensatory mechanism to try and protect them from, from posteriorly dislocating. This is an interesting case example. This is a woman who came into my office with the inability to raise her, her left arm. Obviously she looks terrific with her uh, wonderful lipstick and her earrings on. And she recently had a facelift. And when she had her facelift, there was a, a traction injury to the um, nerve to the trapezius. And she has a trapezial palsy, as you can see here on the left. Uh, so a spinal accessory nerve injury. Sub Fortunately, the nerve was intact and it recovered and the patient was able to, re to re regain her, her motion and function, but kind of an, an interesting presentation of a shoulder pathology. Uh, another um, uh, exam or, or exam maneuver that you can use is a scapular compression test. Uh, this is for patients typically who you're considering surgery on for winging uh, that may typically with serratus anterior dysfunction. And if you stabilize their scapula, uh, they're able to raise their arm up because you're basically substituting for their deficient serratus anterior. And this is a good prognosticator of how they might do with a pec major transfer for for serratus dysfunction. I think one other point too, and on scapular winging is that if you operate on them, it's probably some of the, and if you decide to rehab them, whatever that is, 
it's probably one of the harder conversations as a fellow when you get out to have because you know there there it's a tough rehab it's a tough expectation it's missed a lot and just remember as a fellow that you know when you're examining this this is so important to prognosticate what you think the outcome is going to be for your patients and really talk about it early the other thing to point out, if I may interrupt quickly, is that in Dr. Miller's presentation, every patient has no shirt on. So I think for the fellows, it's important to make sure that you have the patient uncovered. And I see many fellows also never looking at the back of the patient. And Peter, this is a great example of how many of the things you're showing, you can only appreciate from the back. Yeah, you can see in this patient, we have these gowns, which are like a towel. Even <clears> for women, we can have a they can have modesty and we can still see both shoulders just fine. And we, we instruct our patients to come in with a, a tank top or a, um, a, a jog bra or something like that. Uh, so moving on to palpation. So you can learn a lot just by looking at the patient from the front and the back is basically the take home message here. Uh, moving on to palpation, I usually uh, examine all the joints of the shoulder, the, the SC joint, the AC joint, the glenohumeral joint and scapulothoracic articulation. Uh, we palpate typically the, the SC joint, the AC joint, the greater tuberosity, the biceps and the bicipital groove, the coracoid process, and then the posterior joint line. And then in certain settings, we'll palpate along the scapula or along the clavicle, depending on what the, what the, uh, the patient's complaint is, the deltoid insertion along the radial nerve posteriorly. Um, there's a lot of different areas that you can palpate, but these are the major areas. Uh, this is one uh, nice technique you can use if you're trying to palpate the infraspinatus insertion. If you're taking care of a throwing population, you may see a patient who has a partial thickness tear of the infraspinatus. Sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to, to, to access that. And this is actually uh, Dr. Andrews palpating a throwing athlete uh, in the infraspinatus insertion. So you can look for a, a internal impingement type of lesion or partial thickness infraspinatus tear. Uh, range of motion, uh, we typically will look at forward flexion, abduction, uh, external and internal rotation, both with the arm abducted and adducted. Uh, the motions of the shoulder are pretty complex, and Dr. Codman taught us about this. He had this so-called paradox. When you put your hand on your head, is it actually internal rotation and forward flexion, or is it external rotation and abduction? So to get to the same place, you can do different motions. And sometimes patients who have problems with certain motions learn how to work around that. Um, and it's important to carefully examine these range of motions because they can key you in on to, as to what their problem is. Here's a normal uh, exam with forward flexion. You can see he has good uh, symmetric motion. He has good abduction. He has good external rotation that's fairly symmetric and good internal rotation. In addition to this, I would probably add in external rotation at the side and then internal rotation with his hand behind his back as well. Here's a patient here with a problem in his shoulder. He's post-operative and you can see there's a slight um, modification to the way he actively elevates his left shoulder. Uh, he's had a latissimus transfer. He's had a, a good result, but he has obviously has asymmetry of his, of his shoulder. He has symmetric external rotation, but his forward flexion and his abduction are, are different than the contralateral side. Uh, this is a patient who underwent a reverse shoulder replacement. She's a physician. Uh, you can see we can inspect her range of motion. Uh, it's fairly symmetric. She has good abduction strength. Uh, and uh, this would be a good result in an elderly patient who has a kind of limited goals after a, a reverse shoulder replacement. And just one point is just the more consistent you can get in your fellowship and like early on in your practice, the easier it gets in terms of thoroughness, because you can do all of this quickly as he points out and your videos show just how quick it can be, but how important is just the consistency of routine. Yeah, that's a great point. Do you guys uh, recommend your fellows use of a goniometer or estimate the motion, Peter and Bunny? Um, we try to use goniometers. Um, when we get behind in clinic, I can tell you they probably don't always use goniometers, but uh, we try to use goniometers for our patients. I think that after you've used one for a while, you kind of get better at estimating it. Um, the other thing that I always stress to my fellows when I examine range of motion is I 
will, when I put my hands on the patient, I will stabilize the scapula because it's obviously some of the motion is coming through the scapula. And I've had a number of cases where the, the fellow or, or whoever my assistant is will say the patient has full motion. But then when you carefully stabilize their scapula, their motion is actually decreased. And we're going to get to that in a minute, but their motion of the glenohumeral joint is limited and they're, they're substituting through their scapulothoracic articulation. And I, I agree with all of them. I really think post-operatively, probably walking, we do a better job of goniometers, but I think like you said, post-operatively, I think it's the most critical for compensation because it's much more easy when you get, especially in an arthroplasty situation, a lot of different di biomechanics. I think that's when it even becomes more critical. I would say the most common scenario that I see um, with patients um, who have loss of motion would be middle-aged women who have a frozen shoulder that saw an outside doctor and got an MRI and it shows a partial thickness rotator cuff tear and they're sent to me for a rotator cuff tear and nobody's carefully examined their shoulder and what they really have is adhesive capsulitis. And, you know, same thing too with glenohumeral arthritis. They show up, they have severe arthritis, but really it's probably not as significant as their adhesive capsulitis. So, I mean, the other thing is, you know, just being really reminding yourself that passive versus active and documenting it. Because I can tell you, you know, you forget your exam. Sometimes you get busy and seeing a patient in follow-up, sometimes you need a good comparison. So not only examining them, but, but somehow finding a good way to document it is really critical. So in addition uh, to just assessing their range of motion, you will be presented with patients who have loss of range of motion. Uh, stiffness. Um, that can be due to tightness of the capsule. It can be due to extra articular scarring. It can be due to a mechanical block. This is a woman who came in with a complaint of loss of external rotation on her left arm. And when we did a careful history, it turned out that three months prior she had had a seizure and had uh, uh, was seen in the emergency room, got an x-ray, and they told her everything was fine. Well, she had a locked posterior dislocation that was missed and she was unable to externally rotate her arm as a result of that. So it's really important to always carefully examine for symmetry of motion and look for causes of loss of motion. Another uh, type of patient who we'll see with, with um, loss of motion is a patient who has um, glenohumeral internal rotation, a glenohumeral in internal rotation deficit. Uh, give me one second. I'm just going to turn the lights back on here. Uh, this is a, a young athlete who um, had shoulder pain, and you can see that he has loss of internal rotation on his left shoulder. He has increased external rotation. Here you can see we are using our goniometer uh, to assess this. Uh, it's always important on these patients to stabilize the scapula because they can move through the scapula. So we stabilize the scapula, and then when we look at their total arc of motion, which is the external rotation plus the internal rotation. And then GERD, as you see uh, in this shoulder here, is when they have an internal rotation deficit uh, that's greater than 20 degrees. So that's how we define GERD. And then we usually will rehab these patients and most of them will respond to a, a stretching program for the posterior capsule. But it, it can easily be missed or misdiagnosed, so it's always something to look at. And comparing it to the other side, because everybody's a little bit different is also important. Obviously, dominance is important in that situation, but just the subtlety of some people's arc of motions are very different and distorted. Um, we can also see problems where patients have uh, increased motion. And this is a, a gentleman who came to see me when I was a little bit younger, um, and he came to see me when I was still practicing in Boston with a chief complaint of shoulder weakness. When I examined him, you can see the increased external rotation on his right shoulder. I asked him if he had any injury. He's about 30 years old at this time. He said, no. I, I said, are you sure you never had anything? And it turned out when he was around 13 years old, he had an injury to his shoulder and he had a subscapularis avulsion of, uh, with an avul avulsion of the lesser tuberosity. And this is a, you know, 20 years later, he has increased external rotation because he has subscapularis effectively subscapularis deficiency. Uh, strength testing is the next thing after we assess range of motion. We do, we test abduction, looking at the supraspinatus and the deltoid function. Uh, 
You can tend to isolate the supraspinatus a little bit better if you put the arm in lower angles of abduction. Many patients can fool you if you put them at 90 degrees and ask them to, to, to resist. If they have a strong deltoid, you can, be, you can be fooled. They can have a supraspinatus tear and still have, a, have strong abduction. Uh, external rotation, we test uh, the infraspinatus and the teres minor. And then internal rotation is the subscapularis, lat dorsi, and the pec muscles that we're testing. This is how we typically will test the supraspinatus. Uh, and if they're weak in this position, that usually will indicate some type of a supraspinatus pathology or nerve problem. Uh, as I said, if somebody has a really strong delta, you can be fooled. So putting them in a lower abduction angle, you can sometimes isolate subtle degrees of weakness. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it for inspection, palpation, range of motion, uh, and strength testing. Uh, any comments from the panel or faculty before we move on to some of the special tests that you can do in the shoulder? Great. So next we're gonna cover all these special tests of the shoulder. Um, this is a short list of all the special tests. I'm just kidding. Um, there are an inordinate amount of, of tests which have been described for shoulder pathologies. We'll go through a, a few of the ones that I use more commonly in my practice for some of the more common things that we see. Uh, some of the more common things are impingement and rotator cuff tear. So some of the special tests we use are the near uh, impingement sign. Um, Dr. Levine is working where Dr. Near uh, used to work, so I'm sure he learned about this. Uh, I was a fellow with uh, Dr. Hawkins, so I learned about the Hawkins uh, sign, which is basically rotating the greater tuberosity under the acromion. Uh, painful arc of motion is another sign of impingement or rotator cuff disease, where they have pain in that range of motion between about 80 degrees and 110 degrees as the rotator cuff moves under the uh, corpal chromial arch. Hey, Peter. Yes. I just, this is one of my pet peeves. I just want to make sure because I just put it in the chat box. You can't say that the patient has positive near and Hawkins tests if they do not have full passive range of motion. So the, the mistake I see all the time is someone's got arthritis or adhesive capsulitis with 90 degrees of forward elevation. And then the, the resident or a fellow says, yeah, they've got positive near and Hawkins tests. Those tests must have full range of motion or else they're completely useless. So my, my dictation will say not applicable, near and Hawkins, not applicable, applicable because of the frozen shoulder or because of the arthritic shoulder. That's a great point. Uh, when I examine the patient, typically the first thing I do is put my hand on their scapula and test their motion passively. And if it's restricted, then you're looking for adhesive capsulitis or arthritis or something else. Um, if they have full passive motion, then we can go into some of these other tests, but that's a, that's a really great point. So special tests for the rotator cuff. Uh, we have a drop arm sign, which basically means they're unable to elevate the arm against gravity. You can have an, uh, the so-called lag signs. You can have external rotation lag. That's mainly with a tear that involves the super and infraspinatus tendons. You can have a hornblower sign, which is typically with a larger tear, which is a lag sign uh, that involves uh, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and perhaps even the teres minor. Uh, you can have a, a belly press to test the subscapularis. You can have a lift off as is being demonstrated here. This is actually a modified liftoff test that's being demonstrated. Liftoff, you ask the patient to uh, internally rotate and then lift the, the arm off their, the middle of their back. In this case, you actually put their hand in that position and ask them to hold it. So the lag sign is that the hand falls back to the, back to the uh, anteriorly. And then there's a, a test called a belly off test, which is also a sign of subscapularis deficiency as well. And just, just a point of, you know, thing in terms of from fellow wise, when you're in clinic and you have your own patients, a lot of these, I mean, although they're really important physical exam findings, there also have been shown now, there's a lot of, you know, literature that now sort of links outcomes to some of these positive findings. And it's really important when you see some of these things to sort of educate your patients early on that that might modify whatever surgery you're doing. You know, an external rotation lag or a horn blow is really going to affect, even in a reverse situation, sort of 
the subtlety of that and what you need to make sure that your patients understand. Because patients sort of think that when you do these things, you're going to fix all of these findings. And a lot of them are really significant. Yeah, that's a great point. I think it kept, gets back to the point that uh, I made at the beginning that you have to have the correct diagnosis to be able to treat the patient correctly. And the correct diagnosis involves all these subtleties of the exam uh, and what their function is. There are patients who have identical MRIs who have totally different functional, out, functional evaluations when you assess them with exam. And you might choose different uh, procedures based on that. Um, so this is a, a drop arm sign. Obviously, he, he's unable to elevate it actively. If you put it up there passively, his arm falls down because he has a massive rotator cuff tear. Uh, this is the external rotation lag sign that Ralph Hurdle described. You place the arm in maximum external rotation and then you let go and the arm falls back because they have no posterior rotator cuff to support them. Uh, this is the modified liftoff, which we, we showed here. Uh, with the arm in maximum internal rotation. When you let go, the arm falls back to the center of the, of the back. And I, and I personally like to use the modified liftoff. I think it's a little bit, little bit easier. The liftoff, frequently patients will cheat and use, they'll extend their elbow rather than actually internally rotating the humerus and you can get fooled a little bit. So uh, I like this the is modified another... liftoff. Oh, sorry, Peter. And this is another resident fellow mistake too. It's like, if you can't get internal rotation to your waist, you can't say it's a positive liftoff. And that, that is another common sort of miss. Great. Uh, this is the hornblower sign uh, where the arm is placed in maximum external rotation. And as you uh, let go, it falls down. Here's a gentleman here with a massive posterior tear uh, with a positive horn blower sign. Sometimes uh, patients can have weakness uh, due to the fact that they have pain. So uh, a subacromial injection test can be helpful in some cases. I, I would say in my practice, I, I don't use this very often, but historically it's good to know that uh, the injection test is, is helpful in some cases if you're trying to figure out you know, what is the actual cause of, of their weakness. Do they have a tear or is it just because it's uh, in, inhibited by pain? And this is a woman here that you might think has a, a rotator cuff tear because she has the inability to actively elevate her arm. Uh, she has full passive motion, but she has a limited uh, active motion. And then after the injection, her uh, active motion was restored. So this was uh, pain in inhibition that was restricting her motion. Uh, here we examine the, the subscapularis. This is the so-called belly press. You can see how weak he is. He has no internal rotation strength. And then when I ask him to push his hand on his belly, the, the hand pops off. When I internally rotate his arm and hold his elbow, his belly just, his hand just pops right off his belly. And that's the, the belly off test that uh, Marcus Scheibel has described. And then, you know, I'm trained with specific for subscapularis uh, deficiency or, or dysfunction. So, and then, you know, just the, the one common thing I was trained with Dr. Ainati is really the, the compensation here for this test, not necessarily the belly off, but the belly press with wrist flexion as being the compensatory way to, to fake the test. And so just making sure that their wrist is rigid in that test is probably one of the most subtle things that I do think is easy to, to, to overcompensate or to subtly miss. Yeah, they try and extend their arm using their posterior deltoid and flex their wrist to uh, maintain it. And you, if you put the elbow forward like this here, they can't really, they can't cheat as much. So you can see in this patient, uh, he's unable to, to resist that. So I think a physical exam is, is pretty accurate. The, the, I think sometimes when you combine the different test findings, we can have a higher predictive value. Uh, these are some studies looking at that. If you have a painful arc, a drop arm, plus a external rotation lag, the, the, the post-test probability of having a, a large rotator cuff tear is 91% in one study. Uh, we showed that a series of, of exam maneuvers uh, increases the overall accuracy of your diagnosis. So if you have multiple tests uh, or exam maneuvers pointing towards the same diagnosis is more likely to be, be the case. Uh, this is a case example that um, uh, uh, Bonnie sent in. So go ahead and maybe you could 
talk about this one. Okay, well, so it's a 59-year-old with six months of worsening pain. This is actually was another example sent to me by a fellow, interestingly enough, who had just gotten out in practice. So um, it's a little complex, but the idea is just that the pain had been there for a while, and you know the pain was worse with overhead, lifting, reaching, awaking from sleep, and co and complaints of no active external rotation. You know the, the subtlety is sort of you know not many people will complain that specific, but this patient specifically had had previous um, surgery. And so in a massive irreparable cuff, interestingly enough, this patient sort of had a, um, a cuff debridement, you know, and, and, you know, I trained with Dr. Ainati who sort of said there was the right patient for the right surgery. And sometimes these patients in a much more elderly patient can do well, but, you know, this patient initially sort of was supposed to be treated with a cuff repair, it just was irreparable and then keep going. And then basically the patient sort of, you know, shows up like this sort of really limited. And he's got a lot of these positive signs, right? The external rotation lag, the horn blowers, you know, and you're thinking, you know, fine, you know, what are you going to do in these situations? These younger patients, I think this has really become the controversy. But really, I think the importance, I guess, here is really on the emphasis on the exam. <laughs> I'm sure many of you could see an MRI and know exactly what happens, or we could predict a lot of what this patient had in an MRI finding. <laughs> and the critical nature of having those first conversations, knowing the subtleties of the exams and what those prognostic factors are, they're not great, right? So the exam is really such a critical thing in, in what we offer and how we um, relate to patients and communicate expectations for outcomes. And that's really the point of the example. When you've got a horn blowers, when you've got extra rotation lag sign, we all talk about them, but really, you know, you still are gonna, if you try to operate on them, what do you do differently? So keep going. And, you know, here's another example. This is a little bit different in the idea of sort of, I think we a lot of time talk about these exam findings. And this was something to me that I really educated myself in just preparing for this talk. And the idea of pseudoparalysis, and sort of we talk about this a lot, we all talk about less than 90 degrees, and really the traditional pseudoparalysis for us is these massive cuff tears with atrophy. And so, you know, when I was trained 10 years ago, the idea of a reverse and who were supposed to get these certain indications and procedures, and I think you guys as fellows now, the, the procedures have been expanded but we're learning more and more about the subtle exam findings by studying them much more specifically and understanding outcomes for patient specific factors. So keep going on this one. And so the idea of not every pseudoparalysis is the same. And this was a different example, 67 year old shows up and it's a male. And interestingly enough on x-ray, it's a lot more subtle. There's not really the superior anterior super escape but the guy has pseudoparalysis, significant limitation in function, and really basically has a clinically significant anterior superior escape, but not radiographically. So the dynamic nature of some of these exam findings are not always captured. And that's really the most important thing here, because your prognostic finding from patient one, which was the little old lady with a deltoid atrophy, significant fatty infiltration who has pseudoparalysis, and this gentleman who has pseudoparalysis as well, but maybe a much different sort of exam and, and, and clinical presentation with su anterior super escape, it just goes to show how subtle those things are and how important it is that you document that for yourself. <laughs> Keep going. And so I don't, I don't know. So, but the point I was trying to say is sort of you high five yourself. You're like a 76 year old with pseudoparalysis. This is a slam dunk. You know, I know how to treat this. I'm going to be great. You know, but the bottom line is, uh, you know, one exam lady with a deltoid that's thin, that's got some pseudoparalysis versus the second one that has more anterior super escape, a bigger guy. Surgically, there's some subtleties that exams might really like lead to. And, you know, I just sort of brought these up. We're not talking about this in this talk, but the idea is that really it's so important that you guys remind yourselves of this. You see an exam, you see a lady, you know, you know you're doing a reverse, but subtly, and, you know, I have talked to Dr. Ainati about this because I've had a couple of complications. And, you know, complications teach you the most about yourself. And, you know, when you have pseudoparalysis, I, you know, decided I had this, that first lady, you lengthen her a lot, and she ended up, uh, one of my patients ended up with a little bit of a brachial plexopathy. 
So those exam findings and, and understanding that not every patient is the same is so critical. That's the point of the case. So just thinking differently in surgery from an exam. You know, and this is Dr. Frankel's example. And, you know, I stole it because I think, you know, the, the traditional thinking was that pseudoparalysis in general didn't do as well. And that the factor of less than 90 degrees was a critical exam finding. And that was the traditional way we were trained. But, you know, Dr. Frankel actually showed that that was not one of the major things. And that really there's a lot of other subtle critical findings when you're going in there that you want to document, like deltoid um, volume and strength and, and atrophy, you know, any sort of um, correlation with neurologic injuries. There's a, a sort of a different algorithm in pseudoparalysis alone was not it. Keep going, but that's the point. This patient, go ahead, the patient there had pseudoparalysis and did quite well. So not every patient had a poor prognostic factor from an exam finding pre-op. I think those are great points. Um... I think that the examination of the elderly patient with a massive cuff tear is really important and figuring out exactly what the pattern of their tear is, their pattern of their weakness, uh, what their functional deficiencies are really dictates what the treatment will be. Um, and there's a lot of debate about how to treat the massive technically irreparable rotator cuff tear in all age groups. So I think figuring out exactly what you're treating uh, is very important. So moving on, I'm going to talk about uh, the biceps and the labrum. Obviously, I'll start talking about slap tears. There's a, a variety of different uh, techniques or, or tests which have been described for this. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, I would say that probably the, the most common things we, we look at for a, a labral tear would be the active compression test that Steve O'Brien described where uh, the patient's uh, placed in the um, adducted position with the hand internally rotated and they're asked to resist as you, as they push forward, push uh, superiorly, and then you rotate their arm into supination and ask them to resist again. And that should alleviate the, the pain. And you have to be careful to ask them exactly where the pain is located. Uh, you can see that the hand is on the AC joint uh, on the left hand of the examiner. And you wanna make sure that that's not where their pain is. Their pain should be deep inside the shoulder uh, for a positive test. AC joint problems will be exacerbated by this test as well. So a true positive test is really when the pain is deep inside the shoulder. And it also should be a, a test in a, in a patient who's likely to have a symptomatic slap tear, which would be you know, a younger patient maybe that's doing sporting type activities rather than an older patient where maybe they have a degenerative problem. The speed test is done uh, with the arm and forward flexion. Uh, and supinated and the pain is usually reproduced in the bicipital groove with this, uh, with a, for biceps tendonitis. And a just quick point that the, oh, you got it. Uh, the sensitivity and specificity of these tests really, you know, vary. Uh, Steve O'Brien got 100% sensitive and 98.5% specific, which is amazing, but no one else has really been able to, to reproduce that. It's, there's some debate even what's a, a true slap when you look at it arthroscopically. But I think if, if in the right patient with a high pretest probability of having a slap tear based on their history, based on their age, based on their activity, it's a very useful test in my practice um, as long as they don't have concomitant AC joint pathology because then I think it becomes less reliable. Hey, Peter, uh, just a time check. We have about 10 minutes left. Oh, okay. Uh, the crank test is another uh, exam that can be used for, for labral tears. Uh, this is basically analogous to a meniscus type of uh, um, uh, exam for the shoulder where you actually load it and rotate it and try and create uh, mechanical symptoms from it. Kibler's anterior slide test uh, is another test that's been described for looking at anterior superior labral tears as well, uh, placing the, the, hand, the uh, patient's thumb on their, on their hip, and then actually loading it. Uh, these tests, uh, uh, Brian's seem to have the highest sensitivity. Uh, in, in, one step, in one test, I think combining tests, again, uh, can increase your specificity. Moving on to instability. Um, I would say instability is this, the sensation that they're going to dislocate, so just defining it. 
Uh, instability is not the same as laxity. Laxity is just translation of the joint. Instability is a sense of an impending dislocation or uh, subluxation. It's not just pain. Uh, the relocation maneuver, as you see here, is very helpful with the arm place and abduction external rotation. Uh, very high uh, specificity for anterior um, for anterior instability. Uh, some patients will have pain in this position. This is a posterior impingement sign. This is a patient who's placed in abduction external rotation. He's a thrower. And the fellow told me that he has positive apprehension. What he has, he has pain from an internal impingement lesion in his posterior shoulder, not from, not from true anterior instability. So it's important to, to figure out, is it pain or is it truly apprehension that they have? Uh, the load and shift is another uh, uh, set of tests you can do for looking at instability. The standard one is with this patient seated, we can translate anteriorly and posteriorly and quantify the degree of translation. Uh, I, I like to do the modified load and shift where the patient is uh, on their back. I actually load the, the humerus and then I translate it forward or posteriorly, uh, anteriorly or posteriorly with my right hand. I center the joint first and then get a sense of how far I can translate it and I can control the amount of tension in the capsule by how much I rotate the, the humerus. Uh, this is a modified load and shift done in a patient in the OR and an examiner anesthesia. You can see that it translates completely out posteriorly. Uh, posterior instability, uh, we look at posterior subluxation with a posterior stress test, which will cause posterior joint line tenderness from a posterior labral tear. Uh, some patients will complain of posterior apprehension. In my experience, it's not that common that they truly have posterior apprehension. Uh, you might feel palpable crepitation or a click, which tends to have a higher uh, probability that they have a posterior labral tear. The jerk test, uh, you, you actually load the shoulder, you stabilize the scapula, and you uh, push the shoulder posteriorly. Ideally, you typically push it a little bit more inferiorly, and then you bring them into horizontal adduction uh, or abduction and you'll feel the clunk of the reduction uh, as you do that. And that's really a useful test. Uh, and it's really uh, helpful in patients with posture instability. This is it in a, in a sleep patient here. You can see uh, we're loading it posteriorly. It subluxates. And as you, as you abduct it, you can see the shoulder reducing uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the horizontal abduction. Uh, this is another example here in a patient with posture instability. You can see it's posteriorly subluxated and as we abduct it, it subluxates, it, it reduces and that's what you feel the clunk of the jerk. Uh, with posture instability, it's always important to look for a voluntary component. There have been two subtypes described, positional and muscular. Uh, this is a voluntary positional, which uh, can still do well with, with um, uh, surgery. And then there's voluntary uh, muscular where they do it with the arm adducted uh, these patients, in my experience, uh, try and rehab these patients uh, and uh, try and uh, not to operate on these voluntary muscular patients. With instability, we always evaluate their laxity. We look for signs of hyperlaxity at the wrist, at the elbow, whether they have associated patellofemoral instability or other joints that dislocate. Uh, patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and other types of collagen disorders can be quite tricky and it's important to assess for, the, for, a, for hyperlaxity on, on the patients. We look uh, for a sulcus sign, uh, with, which is done with the arm in neutral and an external rotation. We can quantify the degree of uh, inferior translation of the humerus relative to the glenoid, and we get this so-called sulcus here. Uh, you can see it in this patient here as we pull inferiorly. Uh, we can, we can uh, measure the, this, and it can be quantified zero, which is one to zero to one centimeter, grade one, one to two centimeter, grade two, which is greater than two centimeter. In this patient, it really doesn't decrease as you put her arm in external rotation, indicating that she has deficiency in the rotator interval tissues. Here's a, a fluoroscopic evaluation, just demonstrating the same thing with this inferior translation. And this is one of the hallmarks of inferior instability uh, and also patients with multidirectional instability of which inferior uh, translation is a component. Uh, we can also look for a gaget sign, which is a hyperabduction sign. Uh, that's also indicative of uh, injury to the inferior glenohumeral ligament, uh, and it's been defined as asymmetric uh, 
abduction of the glenohumeral joint or greater than 105 degrees on any one side. I'll skip over that in the interest of time. And here you just see an examination under anesthesia demonstrating uh, the translation uh, that can be seen with the sulcus sign and an anterior and posterior uh, excessive translation in this patient with multidirectional instability. Uh, maybe I'll skip over this case example just in the interest of time. Uh, it was an anterior instability case uh, demonstrating some of those points. Uh, it's also important to look at the AC joint and the SC joint. Uh, we examine for tenderness, we examine for de deformity. Cross arm adduction uh, is helpful. Uh, sometimes you get patients who have horizontal AC instability and they'll get impingement on the spine of the scapula and they'll be tender uh, posteriorly on the spine of the scapula. This is a patient here with SC joint instability as he adducts, as a correction, as he uh, retracts and protracts his scapula, you can see the SC joint instability. Uh, this is a, a patient here who has had, is a hockey player with multiple injuries to his uh, right clavicle who comes in with a diagnosis of a tumor. This is actually a pseudotumor. It's due to growth plate injury with hypertrophy of the distal clavicle due to, uh, to recurrent injuries to the growth plate of the distal, distal clavicle. So something to think about that you can see on your physical examination. This is a patient here with horizontal instability with uh, sca the scapula is uh, subluxating under the clavicle. He had a, a type three AC dislocation, but he also has now his persistent horizontal instability. And he ended up undergoing a reconstruction for to stabilize his distal clavicle. To finish up, we always uh, look uh, at the sensation and look at reflexes. It's important to look at the neurovascular structures, uh, refresh ourselves on, on uh, what innervates the shoulder, uh, the reflexes we are most interested, the biceps, the triceps, the brachioradialis. Uh, I see patients, uh, again, every once in a while that have a C-spine injury that comes in with shoulder pain and they, they have significant weakness of their triceps and they have a cervical radic. Um, the motor nerves we look at, the long thoracic, uh, suprascapular nerve, which we see a lot of injuries to, the axillary nerve. I did a woman today that had an axillary nerve uh, uh, palsy. She had quadrilateral space syndrome. We did an axillary nerve neurolysis. Muscocutaneous nerve is uh, not as commonly injured, although you may see a patient that's had a latter J that had a postoperative a muscocutaneous nerve injury, and then the distal nerves, the median radial and ulnar nerves uh, in the hand. Uh, and finally, it's it's important to think about the vascular exam. The shoulder is well vascularized, but you may see patients who have thoracic outlet syndrome, or you may see some throwing athletes that actually have uh, problems with their axillary artery where they have pseudoaneurysms or problems which present as a shoulder problem, but it's really a, a vascular issue uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the upper arm. So in summary, the, sh the shoulder is really a complex series of joints, uh, careful history and a targeted ex exam should lead you to the correct diagnosis. Uh, and really the correct diagnosis is going to be so important to figure out what the appropriate uh, surgical procedure should be. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Vani for, for assisting with this talk. I'd like to thank Bill for his leadership as ASES president, uh, Steve and Anna from ASES who helped put this together and Joaquin for, uh, for really uh, leading the charge on creating this uh, symposium for our, um, for our fellows. Um, Thank you, Peter and Manny. That was, that was outstanding. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive. Love the videos, love the cases. Uh, we don't have any questions through the chat. I don't know if Dr. Levine or Dr. Gupta have any additional questions for Peter or Ron. Ron John, any final okay. comments for uh, start setting off the first week? So first of all, fellows, welcome to an exciting new year. I know it's a challenging time for everyone, but the opportunities to learn are always going to be there. This sessions that we have put together, all the rudimentary are, are some of the best cases for you to come back. You can come back and look at them uh, in the future. And we look forward to having you here over the next eight weeks and we'll continue throughout the year. Thanks everybody. Have a great night. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bonnie. Thank you, uh, Peter. Thank you.